Welcome to Speak the Truth. My name is Gary Johnson. Today is February 6th, part of Black History Month, but we celebrate Black history every day, 24-7, 365. Want to start out here by welcoming you to Speak the Truth. And we're going to start out with a video and some commentary by Professor Eddie Gloud Jr. Well, I, I just want to say, uh, I want to welcome the, the panel, uh, Jacques Chavez uh, is our regular uh, guest here. Uh, Lawrence Lucas, of course, uh, battling for the Black Farmer. Uh, we got uh, John Hollins, uh, my, my dear friend, dear friend from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, who's who's everywhere, all in the community. Uh, uh, the manager of the RBI team for the Atlanta Braves, um, account executive for CBS Television Air, and um, and a community uh, a hero. We got, of course, uh, uh, the facilitator. Uh, we got uh, Gary, Gary Johnson. And I see we got Arlena has joined us today. And we got my co-host, uh, Chris Thomas. Um, Chris Johnson, come on, Chris Thomas. Chris Johnson uh, with us today. Um, I, I, I just want to say, man, that, you know, when I start to think, you know, and I want you all to join in, I'm just going to say this. For, for, for white folks to call us lazy, we spent 250 years building this country. We raised their children. We cooked their dinners. And they're talking about we're lazy, that we expect to be given something. That blows my mind. And, 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 and I think about a conversation that I had with an administrator in the NBA office when I complained about the racism at, at the Washington Wizards facility with a guy by the name of Scott Hall, a, a, a white guy who asked me, did I think he was racist? I just looked at it. I know he's racist. The reason he doesn't understand why he's racist is because he's never walked in my shoes. He's never walked in my shoes. But they will fire one white guy who's a racist and bring in another one right behind him like Scott Hall. So I'm saying, man, this is a, a vicious cycle that goes around and around. And when I told that to the NBA administrator, Tim Frank, he said, Harold, I can't wait for things to get back to normal because of the pandemic. Things are net. When they go back to normal, it is not a black man's normal. It is his normal. It's not our normal. We're going back to the same old thing over and over again. And them brothers and sisters who are going for press credentials at the Washington Wizard, they got to go through Scott Hall. And, and it starts at the top. Leonis, it starts at the top, folks. So I want to bring John Harlins on in. And then, John, uh, I want to just go on around the circle with everybody. You know, Black History Month. Where are we in Black History Month? I wanted to, uh, first of all, thanks again uh, for having me on the show. Um, hey, I want to say hello. Uh, to Mr. Mel Pender. We've met a couple of times in Atlanta. Uh, we opened up the first athletic shoe store over at South DeKalb Mall. I remember coming over meeting him there very shortly after he had won his Olympic medals. And then uh, he opened up a water company. And uh, I live in Stone Mountain. Uh, Mel and used to, I think, live in Southland or somewhere in that area. And uh, we met a couple of times. Uh, past president of the 100 Black Men for DeKalb County. Oh, and, yes. Uh, serve on the board for Grady Memorial Hospital. Mm -hmm. But um, I've always had a lot of respect for you. You've always been a man about uh, doing what is right and doing your thing and always out front. And uh, my, my father-in-law and you uh, became friends. Ben Burr. Uh, I don't know if you remember Ben Burr or not, but uh, military yeah. at the same time uh, mm -hmm. and retired from Western Electric. But as far as uh, the call, I wanted to just kind of say hello to Mel and uh, jump in. Um, I didn't put anything together, uh, Harold. Uh, it's your show, man, and your panel. And uh, I'm just glad you gave me a couple of minutes to speak to Mel. I got a photographer here that's got to shoot me for a short video. I'm doing something um, two weeks from now, and I'm working on that. So I need to kind of get ready for that. But I'm going to keep it on so I can hear it, if you guys don't mind. And I thank you so much, Mel, for being on the show. Thank you. Nice hearing from you. Okay, let's go up. Lawrence Lucas, why don't you come on in uh, and uh, give us a little, little shout out as far as black history is concerned. And of course, 
uh, you being a track and field star at Spangon High School and has traveled all over the country when it comes to track and field, you are very familiar uh, with uh, Mel Pender. So come on in and tell us about Mel. Yes, um, uh, Mr. Pender, I want to say that um, I'm pretty close to your age. And I want you to know that I saw you run many times, mostly indoors in New York, Philadelphia, and DC. And uh, I learned more about you today than I knew of you for all these years. I know you know Lacey O'Neill. I, oh, yes. I know you know Brooks Johnson. Oh, yeah. I know you know uh, Green Sprinter. And you Just all talked to him. together and against each other a long time. I was a coach at the time and a very young coach. And I admired you from the day that I saw you run. And I think the first time was in the Melrose games. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it was Melrose or the Philadelphia Pioneer meet. So I'm taking mm -hmm. you back. But I was about your age when I was coaching. Uh, you may remember uh, Bob Green, hurdler out of Spingarn. Uh, he was running track around that time, and I was his coach at the time. But I can't say enough about what I heard you say. Many times when we go as far as you've been in this country, we forget who we are. It was very gratifying today. You really made my day and made my week because I really feel fulfilled to know that someone of your stature and what you've contributed to this country and what you've contributed to your people, black people, our people, I, I'm kind of taken aback because you've traveled some of the same roads that I've traveled, working for civil rights, but mainly the last 25 years for black farmers of this country. But the only thing I can say, and I don't want to take too much time, I have a lot to say, but, it, but what I have to say encompass what you said to me. Only thing I want to say is thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have not forgotten where you've grown up. And many times when you reach the stature of you in this country, being Black, we forget about the people we've left behind. The only thing I can say to you, Mr. Pender, I have a greater admiration about you as a human being and not as an athlete. I want to say thanks, Harold Bell, for letting me know in time to be on this show. And when I heard you were coming on, I rushed to make sure I got on even 20 minutes earlier today. I may not have been on the screen, but I was sitting here waiting. The only thing I can say is thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Jacques, come on in, Jacques. I always feel that uh, Black history, I think it initially started off as African American studies. Uh, when I was in, uh, at Fremont Heights High School, and I, then I think it got, the name got changed to uh, uh, Black History. And I think uh, that's a more appropriate uh, uh, name for the recognition of, of what uh, uh, representative of Black folks. Uh, I want to say very briefly, uh, Mr. Pender, uh, thank you for your service. I, I did pay attention to you as well in the Olympics back during the day. I always let people know that I wasn't a, a, a player of any kind of uh, athlete or uh, what have you, but I always paid attention to uh, people 
who've uh, done things for the masses. And, and you, you know, being an athlete, you're doing things for the masses. You know, you're sacrificing yourself. And uh, that's, that's very, very important. It's also uh, very important to speak out and speak up. Uh, I think that we have to have that. Uh, and Black history, I've learned so much myself. Uh, uh, being born in Washington, D.C. My father's from down Louisiana, by the way, so I got that Southern flavor too, Mr. M Mr. Pender and uh, Mr. Uh, John Rollins. Uh, but uh, just, again, I uh, want to say that uh, I, I think that we have to continue, uh, just like you said, with educating ourselves and to love ourselves because and, and that the greed at some point has to stop because now we got all these rich Black folks who are doing all kinds of stupid things with their money. And it just irritates me over and over again uh, that that same money could be used to uplift, you know, hundreds of other people. So that's what I have to say today. Okay. Uh, Chris, come on in, Chris. You're the young voice uh, among us. Um, tell us how you feel about Black history, uh, just being a young guy. Uh, where do you see us going, uh, Chris? Any progress uh, in the future? Um, the future prospects aren't looking great. I feel like I mention this every every show, but the, this next generation has um, been pretty hampered and pretty beaten down by the lack of progress, by the lack of representation, by the, the lack of um, responsiveness to our voices and our demands and things like that. Um, our, the minimum wage, if it had kept up with inflation from the 1970s, should be over $22 an hour. It is $7.25 still. It's stagnant. Wages are stagnant. The American dream is stagnant. Back in the day, you know, you, you work hard to, to afford a good life, you know, to be able to afford a house, start a family. Those things aren't affordable for our generation anymore. So when you're looking for fighters and represent, you know, people to represent the next generation, from what I see is it's not, it's not looking good because, you know, we're drowning in student loan debt, something Joe Biden could fix with the swipe of a pen tomorrow, but he won't. Um, there's um, a lot of issues that are hampering the next generation of leaders because they're drowning. They've been economically crushed. Um, jobs don't pay what they used to, but goods and um, services are way more expensive. Housing and rent is more expensive than it's ever been. There are a lot of issues like that. So when you're looking for leaders to be active and involved in political situations, it's really hard to do that when you're working 60 hours a week to make maybe $25,000 a year or something like that. You know, something terrible, you know, that half the country makes under $30,000 or less. And that was before the pandemic before the, the Trump tax bill, all things that are gonna redistribute wealth even worse and even further. So the poor are gonna be can continue to get poorer. Our climate is literally maybe unsustainable in the next 50 years or so. No one seems to be able to, to care about that because uh, fossil fuel interests have a stranglehold on our politicians. So we're watching our planet burn and um, we're not doing anything about it. Actually, we're doing the reverse. We're aggressively making it worse in the name of money for the greed of a small group of you know, fossil fuel executives. So that will depress young people when we're watching, we're, we're begging for our, you know, for our future and for our kids' future to have a habitable planet. And we can't even do that. So it is quite bleak. Okay. Arlena, Arlena, you want to come in and say something? Or are you just on mute? Arlena? Uh, good evening, everyone. And all I can say, CJ, is you hit all the right points. And I do want to express my gratitude that Dr. Pender allows me to represent him. And in working with him, he continues to in, inspire, inspire me. When I first start, met Dr. Pender and his wife, Debbie, um, I was recovering from being a caregiver, and despite my gifts and talents, I was very hopeless. But when I connected with them, and I have to give him props through uh, Mel's uh, 1968 uh, cohort, Ron Freeman. Uh, I think Ron was in the 4x400, four but he's the one that introduced me to uh, Mel and his wife. And uh, I, all I can say is, is it, it's a blessing to even be able to work with someone like Mel. And I am truly grateful. I learned from him. He inspires me. I've experienced, I'm 62 
and I've experienced a lot of the same things. I've been told a lot of the same things, not because I was a woman, but because I was black. And so I remember a time, and you guys can remember a time when a black woman was not welcome in the realm of professional sports in the Olympics. And I devote my time and my life to helping the retired athletes. A lot of them did not make the kind of money that the guys are making today and the women are making today. And so I make a sacrifice. But like CJ said, it's getting really, really difficult to live with meaning and live with a cause. But we have to keep the faith. And that's why with every conversation that I have with Mel, mm -hmm. he expresses hope. So I'm not giving up hope. I'm not giving up hope that he will see a change. And I'm not giving up hope that CJ, you know, somehow we will be able to overcome a lot of those obstacles, real obstacles and mm -hmm. problems that you shared with us as I think you're a millennial. You look young enough to be a millennial, but you were right on point. And uh, I'm just praying that uh, I don't wake up one day and we don't have the uh, Harold Bells and, and the Gary Johnsons and the John Hollins and the Michael Jacksons and the Lawrence Lucases. And, and, and I think it's uh, Jack. Yeah. Jack. Jack. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, so thank you. Thank you very much uh, for allowing me to express my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, we have come a long way, but we still have a long way. We have a long way to go. We've advanced in some areas, but we've regressed in others. And thank you very much. And I just want to say happy Black history to all of you. Okay. Gary, I want you to come in and give your opinion. Then uh, I want you to run that piece on Mel Good and Muhammad Ali, then we'll come back to Michael Jackson. Go okay. ahead. Uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing Mel uh, several months ago last year, and I knew of him, but like Mr. Lucas said, I came away with a greater respect for him as a person. And I make a lot of short video clips. And I'll tell you, one of my proudest uh, accomplishments is that short clip that we showed that I put together with Mel. I love that clip, not because I made it, but because it just says so much about the man in a short period of time and the music, the soundtrack, it's positive, it's upbeat. That's one of my top things that I, that I love about him. And like he said, at 84 years old, he ain't holding back. He probably never held back. He's speaking the truth, which is what we do here. So that that's, I mean, I, I love that. And we're going to rerun that piece on Black Men in America later on today and put it back on the homepage and circulate it again so people know, because it's in our archive section, but we want people to know what's going on. And so I'm going to run this other piece, um, Mr. Bell. And we're going to uh, see this. This is for this is the another male. And here we go. Let's take a listen. You've been invited to a number of countries, too, haven't you, Cash? Yes, sir. Countries such as uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Thailand, Malaya. Uh, when do you plan Egypt to go? In all these countries. When do you plan to uh, go? In a couple of months, I like to start my world tour. And I expect to be gone for as long as a whole year. Cassius, uh, controversy, not controversy, but there's great interest in the fact that you have joined the Muslim religion. How long have you had this interest, Cassius? Oh, for the past six years, I would say, after hearing a lot of teachings on Negro history and who we were before we got here, and one and one makes two, and here I met nothing but Muslims from all over the world, and they all... You mean here at the United Nations yes, today? Uh, I recognize all of them, and they recognize me, uh, but until then, I could walk in here and wouldn't know nothing about what's going on, but now I can look at people from all over the world, regardless of the race, creed, or color, and talk intelligently with them, and most of all, recognize all of my brothers and sisters in the East, people that I haven't recognized over my lifetime. Cassius, you, uh, there's some talk about your buying a home here. Is uh, Have you made the purchase yet? Well, yes, I'm uh, look, uh, scouting now, 
and some some home on outskirts of town I'll soon be picking. Is, is this the reason for your, this particular trip to New York? Well, yes, I have enterprise set up here. I'm incorporated now mm -hmm. and have a lot of business to attend to. And like I said, this is the center of the world. A whole lot is going on here. And, uh, this is the city. You're winning the championship. Do you feel your affiliation with the Muslim religion? Being a follower of the Muslim religion had something to do with your winning the championship? Well, I would say so. Uh, my religion is what the only thing that I can give me credit for pulling me through because uh, 99 out of 100 seem to see no possibility of me winning. The newspaper reporters and everybody all over the world condemned me. They said it would be a mismatch and everybody, couldn't nobody believe it. So uh, my prayers to uh, Allah and uh, faith in my religion, living a clean, righteous life, I have to say that's what pulled me through. Do you think you'll, uh, you'll have to go in the army before you fight again? Have you, do you know yet? Well, I really don't know. I'll cross those bridges when I get to them. <laughs> Fine. Thank you very much, Cassius. Yes, it's been sir. real nice to have you Thank here you as, a, as, a, as a representative of the uh, blue boxing world. Thank yes, you. sir. Malcolm, could I stop you? You still want to keep going, Mr. B? <laughs> I, I just wanted to um, introduce that piece because the guy that was interviewing Muhammad Ali is named Mal Good. He was the first televised news person on major television in 1963. That interview with Muhammad Ali took place at the United Nations in 1964. And of course, you saw Malcolm X in the picture and you saw Rahman, his brother, and the other guy was an ambassador from Nigeria. But I want to spotlight Mal Good and how he opened the doors for so many Blacks, including myself. That was 1963 when he was first on NBC. And uh, of course, I became the first black uh, sports uh, to do a, a sports special on NBC affiliate WRC TV4 here in uh, Washington, D.C. in 1975. You guys have probably have not heard a lot about Mal Good, but Mal Good was a trailblazer. And he doesn't get really much play, if any play. And I always wanted to uh, introduce you to this man because... Uh, he opened up the doors for many, many, many of us. And he was a class act, man, when it comes to journalism and, and television. So I want to introduce uh, a Mal to us. I want to I wanna go right now. I want to go back to Mal because in that, in that clip was Muhammad Ali. And I know Muhammad Ali, you guys were good friends. And you even did a sports shoe for Muhammad Ali. Is that right, Mal? Uh, I mean, Mal, did you get a sports shoe for Muhammad Ali? Mel, yo, you still on? You still on mute, Mel? <laughs> Mel, you still on mute? And yes. Uh, when I when I retired from the military, I designed a shoe mm -hmm. from a company called Mitre Sports out of England, and uh, I started a, a girl all girls track team uh, in Atlanta. At the same time, I owned a sporting goods store called Athletic Attic, mm -hmm. and we uh, the people that I was working for from England uh, wanted to do a big um, um, show uh, on the shoe. In other words, they wanted to have a lot of publicity on the shoe that I designed. And we got Muhammad Ali to come in to be one of our sponsors. In other words, we put on a, we put on a, a track meet in California, Muhammad, Muhammad Ali track meet in Los Angeles. And that's how I was involved. We got to know uh, Muhammad Ali. The shorts that he wore was, <clears throat> that he wore in that fight and the shoes that he wore, the boxing shoe was made by Miter. Uh, if you notice on the on the shoe and also on the shorts, it's had, had an M on it. But I got to know Mahan Ali very well, and the kids uh, just went crazy uh, seeing Mahan Ali and having Mom, having Muhammad Ali named uh, a part of the uh, of the track meet. I took the fastest girls, the top girls in Atlanta from the high schools in Atlanta. It was 15 of them, and we traveled all over the United States uh, uh, competing. Uh, with, Muhammad, with uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, brand name on the shoe and, and Miter. The, the Miter, we put Miter on his shorts because the shoe was named Miter, M-I-T-R-E. Mm -hmm. So uh, he uh, was really great with the kids. You know how he is, man. He's he great with all kids. people. He loved kids. Michael Jackson. Michael, come on in. I want to, Michael, one of the things, I want to switch, kind of switch lanes here. Of course, uh, Biden is talking about uh, nominating a 
black woman to the Supreme Court. Uh, is that going to happen, and will it help us? It's going to happen. It's going to happen, and I do think it's going to help us. That's the, as I done said before, when I'm uh, arguing with CJ about uh, Obama, that's my main criticism of, of Obama, President Obama, that he did nominate a black to the Supreme Court. But uh, Biden is going to, and I, and who knows, that might actually influence Clarence Thomas to have a, another black there to, to, to have discussions with him uh, on issues that he done somehow gotten away from. And so it's going to happen. I'm glad the, the, uh, uh, the guy resigned in time to get this done. But yeah, it's going to have a big impact. He'll nominate the right black female. Uh, she'll be very well qualified, and but she will be somebody that understands a lot of the uh, issues that are, are going on with minorities, and that would help. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mel, what, what do you think about uh, uh, Biden nominating a black woman? I saw about five or six of them that he's thinking about it nominating i'm just hoping uh we don't get stuck like we got stuck with clarence thomas i swore that clarence thomas was going to change his colors once he got on the supreme court but i was dead wrong so i'm glad that we got attorney michael jackson with us today to, to explain that process now what are, what are your thoughts on uh a black woman being nominated to the supreme court take yourself off mute mel take yourself off mute you still Mel, take yourself off. The greatest off. things could happen uh, in this country to have a black woman on the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm praying that she don't be another Clarence Thomas. Uh, you know, they're getting ready to give him an award in Atlanta. They're trying to. Uh, but when I saw that, I, my, my stomach turned sour. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully that uh, he'll pick the right person and she would do her due diligence and do the right thing to change, get some changes made to help make some changes in the Supreme Court in this country. It should have happened a long time ago. I, you know, we, you see what's there now. We, we got only one and he's not really black. I don't know what you want to call him. But anyway, I have no respect for him. Uh, but uh, you see what Trump uh, did while he was uh, in office. And he would run the country selecting people except for the Supreme Court, so all the country. And he, one way he's smart in doing that. I mean, he knew what he was doing. And we still got a problem with that area, uh, with the uh, Supreme Court justices in different parts of the United States. Mm -hmm. But we need somebody there that's going to stand up and, and stand up and, 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 again, like John Lewis said, speak out when he, they see something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we can make a difference, try to make a difference in this country with, our laws, with the laws of, uh, uh, in, the, in America. You know, we, we, we got problems. And... I hear people say, well, we, we made some changes. We made very few changes. I, I did just my opinion. Yeah. We made very few changes in this country, man. And, and, I, and I just hope one day that uh, if I don't see it, uh, the younger people can see it like CJ. You know, CJ made a big impression on me because he knew he really knows what's going on. It's going to take people like him around his age. It's going to change things in this country. But you know, one thing I want to say uh, is that when I saw what happened, uh, the marches, when all these young black men were being killed by, the, by these policemen, and I saw all these young black, young people out there marching and, and protesting, but not only black, and I saw people from all nationalities all over the world protesting. That's what we're gonna need in this country, man, to change. We're gonna need those people, his people, his age, to get out there and make changes, run for office, get out there, you know, you, you, you can see the problem. You see the problem, CJ. I don't have to sit here and talk about it. And you need to have all your people, all people around you, your age, working with you to make so they can see what needs to be done. Like I said, they don't know that like most black kids don't know that anything about their heritage. They don't know. Who, they don't even know who Jesse Jackson is. They don't even know who some kids don't even know who Martin Luther King is, man. I mean, they don't know his what he's done for this country, what he did. Uh, and C.D. C. Vivian, who is C.D. Vivian? They don't know who C.D. Vivian is. They don't know. Jose Williams, all his people. I mean, until they learn and see what's, what's happened in the past, 
to, 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 to keep us back, then they can maybe come up with some idea of what they need to do to make a change like you, CJ. I want to say, uh, you know, we had a couple of weeks ago, we had a guy on, on the show by the name of Matthew Falk. Uh, Matthew Falk uh, has been fighting uh, racism in the U.S. Marshal Service for over 40 years. And uh, this guy, you know, he, I mean, he put his life on the line. He, one of his buddies got killed. You know, they knocked off one of his buddies, and he's lucky to be alive today. But he's still out there fighting. And uh, just last week, the Washington Post did a front page story on Matt Fall. Not only did they do a front page story, but the whole page six was on the U.S. Marshal Service and how racist the U.S. Marshal Service is. And this goes all over the country for law enforcement. We're still being shot. Doors still being kicked down. And Matthew Fogg is out there. He is really an American hero, man. There's no doubt he's an American hero. And he's still out there fighting a the good fight. They get ready to carry it uh, to the next level as far as the court system. The U.S. Marshal Service is finally look like they're going to get a hearing on the racism in the department. And why should that interest me? Because my brother was a U.S. Marshal. And I still had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the U.S. Marshal Service. It's a good thing I had Judge Luke Moore in my corner, Judge Luke Moore was the first modern day uh, brother in charge of the U.S. Marshal Service. So he had to go speak up for my brother to keep his job. My brother had on the police department stood up the same thing. The thin blue line and code of silence is still in law enforcement all over this country, man, all over this country. Gary, you got a, a, a piece on Matthew Fogg. Let's, let's show them who Matthew Fogg is. youth employee working for number five precinct they throw me and i would have to get in their cars and like they park up the block i have to either back up or take it around the block he's a kid sitting in a police car oh man my chest just grew about 10 inches man you know because i get in the car and i'm riding he said i started thinking this is what i want to do i became supervisor of group 42 for the drug enforcement administration they cross designated me DEA. So now I'm doing, I'm doing double dual tasks. I'm a U.S. Marshal. I'm a special agent DEA. That's when I picked up the name Batman. I'm talking about Gotham City, man. We were rolling, man. We were jumping on guys in the middle of the night, all of that swooping down on folks all across the country. And using these sort of tactical operations that we went out on, that you would use in Vietnam or using some type of war torn zone, and all of the stuff that we were doing, just calling it the war on drugs. And it wasn't very many black guys in my position. So when I would go into the war room where we were setting up all of our drug and gun addiction task forces, determining what cities where we're going to hit, I would notice that most of the time was always appeared to be urban areas. And that's when I asked the question, well, don't they sell, sell drugs out Potomac and Springfield and, and places like that? Or maybe y'all think they don't. The statistics show they use more drugs out in those areas than anywhere. The special agent in charge, he says, you know, we go out there and start messing with those folks. They know judges, they know lawyers, they know politicians. You start locking their kids up, somebody's going to jerk our chain. He said, they're going to call us on it, and before you know it, they're going to shut us down, and there goes your overtime. What I begin to see is that the drug war is totally about race. If we was locking up everybody, white and black, for doing the same drugs, they would have done the same thing they did with prohibition. They would have outlawed it. They would have said, let's stop this craziness because you're not putting my son in jail. My daughter's not going to jail. If it was an equal enforcement opportunity operation, we wouldn't be sitting here anyway. It's all about fairness, man, and understanding how would I want to be treated? Whether I'm on that one end or the other end, how would I want to be treated if everything was done equally? Yeah, that's, uh, that's Matthew Fogg there. And, uh, you can find him on, you can Google him, uh, Badge, uh, Biggest with Badges. Google Biggest, biggest with Badges, and you see uh, Matthew Fogg and the, the heroic stand that he's been taking for 40 years, man, against the U.S. Marshal Service. They're as racist as they can be, and I've seen them up close and personal. Um, let's go to uh, uh, something else that's very important that we missed last week, Gary. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, the founders of Black Lives Matter stole over three or four million dollars from the organization. They brought several homes and left the organization, just got out, man. 
I mean, that is shameless. Here we, we've got these people all over the country supporting these people, man. And they steal the money, man, and co and and resign from the organization. Uh, we ain't got much time. Let me come come to uh, Michael Michael Jackson on this. Michael, what about this, man? Black Lives Matter. Well, that's saying. Uh, I think CJ talks about this a lot uh, about our so-called leaders, uh, greedy, money hungry, worshiping money. How in the world, when you try when folks are getting killed by law enforcement and all these protests are going on and you're stealing the money and feel good about that? That just, I mean, that's sad that we see that over and over. We see that uh, preachers, some civil rights folks, uh, you name it, we can list folks, we can talk about them. Uh, I know me and Mr. Lucas have ran across some of the same characters that people see on TV, but they're ripping off uh, Blacks in the name of so-called doing something for civil rights. But that, that just, that's pitiful that uh, and they really need to go to prison, the ones that did this. Yep. Uh, there's only so much money. And once that happens, people are going to be uh, reluctant to donate any money. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, one thing, man, that, that's why I was kids in trouble for 45 years. I never took a dime. I never wanted a grant or a loan because there's nothing but a setup, man. You cannot steal, man. And, you, and don't think that these folks could not catch you, man. So it, 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 is, it is shameless, man, that a black organization, those to be out there to support and help black folks, man, they steal the money, man. And uh, like I said, we run out of time. But I'm going to come to Mel. Mel, what do you think about that, Mel? Can't hear you, Mel. You're still on, you're on mute, Mel. <laughs> you're on mute, Mel. You know, we, we are our own enemies. We, we hurt ourselves, man. Uh, remember, uh, remember the movie, um, uh, what's this movie where uh, the slave master, I always have this black slave master, man, what was it? Um, I remember. The Django, remember the Django? Django, Django. Django. Uh -huh. Okay, that's us. Yeah, and we can make a dollar. We gonna do. We'll we'll sell our we'll sell our mama. We'll sell our papa. We'll sell our own child to get a dollar. I was just talking about that with a friend of mine this morning, that played for the NFL. How his family stole money from his mother. Hmm. It happened to me and my family the same way. When my mother passed away, I had one of my granddaughters. I take money from her, her account mm. and she raised her. Uh, I've, I've seen this so much. I've seen us stab each other in the back for a dollar. When we killing each other every day on the streets for drugs and a dollar. When are we going to stop this? When, when are we going to stop this? This is why the white man loves us out there. Kill them all. Let them kill each other. That's, that's what they're saying. Let, let, them, let, let those so-and-so, let them kill each other. That's what's happening. Yeah. We hurt ourselves. Why would they steal money from Black Lives, Lives Matter? How do you think that makes us look, man? How do you think that makes us look around the world? When we are here fighting for, for civil rights, fighting again for, for the opportunity to be Black Americans in America, have our own country, and we're stealing from each other. I mean, Black Lives Matter did a great job. I think they, they, what they when they started that organization, I think they did a great job. But when I heard they stole monies and buying million dollar homes and and then resigning, mm. when is it going to change? What do you think white people think about us, man? Think about that. What do you think they think about black people? They don't think very much about us. They don't get. They don't care about us. Well, we're going to destroy ourselves. Right. They said, "Let them go. They, they'll destroy themselves." You know. John Hollins, are you still there? Come on in. We've run out of time. We want to try to give everybody a chance to speak on this. John, you no, know, John may be in the shoot. Uh, let's go up to um, Jacques. Take a minute, Jacques. Black I Lives think it's I think it's absolutely appalling and sinful uh, what Black Lives Matter has done. First off, uh, we should have never jumped behind following three uh, lesbians uh, leading black men. That was our very first mistake. Like it or not, that cannot be denied. 
So uh, they did a they didn't do a good job, in my opinion. I would have to deal uh, uh, differ with you a little bit, Mel. They started off good, but they definitely did not do a good job uh, because of the way that they raped and robbed our people and the, and the corporations all across this country. Uh, they stole something like I think it's more like eight million dollars, Harold. You said three million. I think it's more like eight million. And, and it's probably a lot more than that because now the books are all in shambles. But eventually they'll probably have to answer. Then again, it may not. They bought uh, uh, houses outside of the country as, as well. So uh, I, I, uh, I, I know for me personally, I'm not giving to any more organizations like that, period. And certainly not with no lesbians uh, leading me as a black man who is a heterosexual 100%. Uh, and and that, was the, that was our first problem that all these black men are running behind letting lesbians lead us. So okay. there it is. All right. OK. Hey, why don't you ask CJ what he thinks? Huh? OK. Ask okay. CJ what he thinks about that. OK, let me go to Luke first. Luke, take a minute there, Luke. Well, I, I don't want to take C. I, w- I would like to uh, hear CJ first, because I don't want you to run out of time and not get his response. I, I can go last. OK, CJ. Um, I think it just goes back to what, what I, I touch on all the time in the show is uh, the lack of leadership and why there is no organization on, on, the, on the next generation. I kind of talked about it before, the stranglehold of economics. You, you touched on the violence in the black community. We're going to kill ourselves. We're fighting over scraps. We're fighting over petty things. So small bucks, $20, $50, 100 bucks, people dying, getting killed over it. And those are just scraps. When you put that much economic pressure, when we have that little wealth in our community, that's what happens. People are fighting over scraps and dying over scraps while the, the billionaires just chill and they're watching. Like I said, they're, they're relaxing. They're, they're watching us just pick each other off and, and they're watching us fight each other while they continue to run away with the, with the profits. They're the ones profiting. They're the ones who bought the politicians. We talked about the judges. Trump stacking with judges. We talked about is a black woman judge going to help us? The, the way our generation sees it is like, I, who is the black woman? What is her, what is her ideology? I don't care about their skin color. Tim Scott is a black man. We talked about um, Clarence Thomas is a black man. It's not just about race. It's about what you actually believe in and what you're going to bring to the, to the table. And the Biden administration has shown that they're not going to put anyone in our best interest at, at the top of any position. It's just, it just is what it is. Like they've shown that again and again. Biden this week went on national TV talking about how Mitch McConnell was his friend, his genuine friend. Mitch McConnell's his buddy and he, all, he keeps his word. He's a man of his word. And that Mitch has never done him wrong. That's what we're dealing with. It's a, it's a uh, as George Carlin said, it's a big club and we ain't in it. That's right. I want to say uh, there's a lot of controversy about uh, bums being planted on black universities around the country, HBCU. But you know what this really is? This ain't nothing but a bunch of cowards hiding behind Black History Month. They figure that they don't want us to have our own, no Black History Month. I, Black history is every month to me. I don't care what that word or anything. But they are threatening to put bombs on black colleges just to disrupt what's really going on. And they got these, they these kids, some of these kids are not paying attention to it, but you don't know what these damn fools might do. So you got to have the police come on and, and clear the campus with the dogs and everything to make sure that this is not going to happen. And you know. I, I don't, I don't, they, they will pull anything to disrupt what the real deal is when it comes to, to Black America. One of the other things is that seniors beware of scams. Well, one of the things that we've been doing out here on Speak the Truth for well over, going on a year now, we're talking about scams being played on seniors. Over $2 billion a year, man, seniors are being scammed. And we, over and over again, I've said it, and finally they put, uh, an uh, advertisement on WHUR radio. Now, you, you think they just put that, that advertisement on WHUR radio out of the blue? It's because we were saying something about it. And then this month's ARP cover story, they got uh, uh, seniors, something about uh, seniors beware of scams. And so, man, it's the same thing over and over again. Gary, what, what did you find out on that, Gary? With well, the- one of the things I did was follow up with AARP, but I also went and because I wanted to find out what are the top 10 scams, uh, and they're mostly financial, targeting seniors. And we just launched something on the Black Men in America. You can see it, but 
basically to give you a quick rundown, the top 10 financial scams targeting seniors are the government imposter scams, which is number one, where someone calls a senior and purports to represent uh, somebody from the federal government. The grandparent scam, where uh, a senior gets a call and then the, the, the voice on the other end says, hi, grandma, do you know who this is? And when grandma guesses a name, then that scammer says, yes, yes. And before you know it, they've got grandma sucked in because they say they give them a hard luck story about needing some money. Now, what grandparents not going to try to help their grandson or daughter? You know, so that's one. The if you see the Medicare health yeah. insurance scams. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. You see those what every 10 minutes on Everywhere. networks, George, you know, with George, George, George Foreman, Jimmy George. Walker. Hey, Tom. Hey, Mel, tell us about George Foreman in the 1968 Olympics, because I saw eyes on the prize and I. I, I didn't see George Foreman nowhere in that piece, man, on PBS. And this, I'm talking, this was John Carlos and Tommy Smith being banished from the Olympic Village and George Foreman's in the ring waving the flag after he wins the championship. I talked to Spencer Hayward and several guys. They were really teed off at George Foreman, but this is the George Foreman that we know today. He ain't doing nothing but scamming anybody that he can for a dollar, and he got probably got more money than he will ever see. What was the relationship in the Olympic Village as far as uh, George Foreman was concerned, uh, Mel? Well, uh, when he did that, um, most of the black athletes was really pissed off at him. You know, <laughs> after what John and Tom, uh, Tommy Smith did, and then he goes up there with two American flags, waving two flags uh, <laughs> in the ring. Uh, everybody called him a house nigger. Excuse me, I'm gonna tell you like it is. He was the biggest house nigger at the Olympic Games. Mm. Uh, he uh, it was all about a dollar, you know. Mm. He he when he did that, people and and then he got then he then he brought him to the White House. Yeah. Do you know they did not bring the 1968 uh, athletes to the White House? They brought him. They didn't bring that the team most every, most of every team that went to Olympic Games went to the White House, but except 1968. Wow. But he was there. He was there, even with the flags in his hand. Did you see that? Do you remember seeing that on the news? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was there, and uh, it was horrible, man. I, 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 you know, I, I had a lot of respect for him at one time, but then I see him on TV making all this money, skinning and grinning like some house nigga. It just bothers me. Yeah. Okay, um, you know, we got a lot of we got a lot of people like that, man. I, I, it's just amazing how they sell their souls when I see. Uh, Trump speaking, and you got these uh, blacks coons, I call them, standing up behind him with a shirt, blacks for Trump. Yeah. How Jim can Brown, your boy Jim how, Brown? How can you know, Jim Brown was one of them. Jim well, Brown. well, I know Jim very well too. Yeah. Uh, Jim Brown <laughs> is another one. He's from a little small town in Georgia, mm -hmm. near um, where I used to run Job Corps, man, charge a Job Corps for the, for the uh, manpower training. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and where he came from, man, was an island. Of, it was a, it was an island owned by black people. That's right. Well, you know that or not? Oh yes, I know Simon's yeah. Island. Simon Island. Right, Simon. Right. I know. And for him to get on TV with with this rapper, uh, another Kanye. Big one. West. Kanye yeah, West. Yeah. Well, he's another one that uh, <laughs> I have no respect for. <laughs> I mean. Uh, and, and sit there and just look and just shake his head, mm -hmm. just shake his head. And Conway's, I mean, let me tell you something. I don't want to, I don't want to keep going and going, but sometimes my own people disappointed me so bad, man. I, I just, just shake my head. What, what are we doing? Who, what's going to come by that? What's going to come by um, those black people standing behind Trump with t-shirts on saying blacks for Trump? Trump is Trump going to, you know, they're probably getting paid. What, what do you Jim, think Trump gonna make them rich? Jim Brown, what, gave, Jim Brown got fifty million out of it. Fifty million. You, Trump gave. Are him, you serious? Yes, I'm serious. Gave him fifty million dollars, man. <laughs> yeah, I ain't heard from him since. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> hey, look, man, I, we running out of time, but I want one thing. I know, yeah, I want to. I'm still gonna give everybody a minute to go out here, but I got to say this: the big thing is. The Super Bowl is coming up next Sunday. 
And as we head into the Super Bowl, it's the same old thing. They got one yep. black coach yep. out of the 32 teams. The Rooney rule came in, and it still didn't do any good for them to interview. These folks don't care, man. No, they don't have not one black owner in the NFL, no black owners in Major League Baseball, one black, I think he's black, Michael Jordan in the NBA, in the National Hockey League, no black coaches, no black owners, no nothing. So why? These are plantations, man. And I've been saying this thing since 1972. These are plantations, man. So we got to keep on moving and keep on standing up and, and, and saying what's on our mind, giving a shout out. Let's, let's go to Arlena real quick, Arlena. John is back. John, come on in. What about the black coaches, John, NFL? John, are you there? Okay, Arlena, real quick. Arlena, are you there? Okay, we go up to Luke. Lucas. Oh no, I just you know like I I don't I don't really have any comments. I'm I've okay. just really enjoyed the show. Thank okay, you. Okay, man. All right, Luke. Um, it's nothing but a plantation. Plantation. Uh, and I'm glad that um, Mel mentioned that that movie. Uh, we've got this plantation mentality all the way from Hollywood to athletes. Uh, and especially our politicians. Right, right. And uh, I would like uh, for uh, one day to talk with Mel about the conditions uh, surrounding and what happened during uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. I know there's a story to be told and maybe at some point in time, we'll maybe be able to get him back to one and talk about it. We'll get Mel, Jock, Jock, what, real quick. Uh, yes, I just want to say uh, thank you to all of you uh, folks that's in your 80s. I believe that's called Arcarians. Am I right? <laughs> uh, I was uh, glad to be here. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I just that, you know, uh, you all have, have trailblazed. Y'all have done so much over the years. And uh, I, I also just very quickly think that uh, Black Lives Matter, to hop back on that for a quick second, they should have been talking about the black on black crime as well because uh, we kill each other more than the cops do. It's still bad. Either way, it's still a bad situation. And I, I just wish the best for our people. Okay. Michael, Michael, Michael Jackson, Attorney Michael Jackson, what you got the last word? I don't think um, these um, black guys the power they have, that they could actually uh, leverage and and probably get more black owners. I did want to uh, mention, we never mentioned Jeter is technically an owner of uh, the Marlins, uh, Derek Jeter. One of the and, biggest times going. One of the biggest times out there. Well, <laughs> I did want to throw out there. <laughs> the first order, you know you know what his first order was, Michael? You know what his first order was? Fire all the black uh, guys working on staff. That was his first, two Hall of Famers. They told him, go fire him. That was his first order from the Marlins, man. So well, please, I, please I get, don't put that brother out there. Hey, look, I get that the point somebody made earlier about it just ain't a black face. They got to be, I think CJ or, or Mayor said that, that it had to be somebody that uh, is sensitive to uh, the minority needs. So anyway, uh, it's sad though that it, whether it's one or two black owners in all these different major league sports, that's still sad. That's plantation. Okay, uh, CJ, real quick. Yeah, going back to the coaching thing, I think Nick Wright um, on TV, um, I forgot what show he hosts uh, on, on Fox Sports, whatever, made a great point. Just imagine uh, as a thought exercise that the NHL, what if um, all but one of their coaches was black? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be weird? Wouldn't, wouldn't people be asking questions about that? Would it, the all-white league, if every single one except one of their coaches was black? That's literally what's happening in the NFL right now, and they're trying to pretend that there's no grievance, that Brian Flores in a lawsuit, that there's nothing there. A coach who went 19-14 and 14 in, in his past couple of seasons was fired. When we have seen, especially me as a Washington Commanders fan, a garbage nickname, <laughs> um, <laughs> We've seen so many mediocre coaches last three, four, five years, go on, get new jobs after that, get second, third, fourth chances. But these black coaches can't get that in the NFL. They're, they're a, a league that's 70 percent black. All of it's just a coincidence. And they want us to believe that it's based on merit. 
that all of these coaches are white, every single one. It's complete BS. Well, as we get out here before I give Gary the last word, we got to remember Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> she opened up her mouth. She opened up her mouth talking about the Holocaust, that it was a, a, it was a human rights uh, issue. And really, she was wrong. It was not a human rights issue. It was a racial issue. It was a racial. Uh, uh, Hitler was about racism, man. You know, the Germans about racism. And what she, what she did, she apologized. She realized that she had misspoke. So she apologized sincerely. Say, I made a mistake. But you know what? You know what those folks did that run, that run that network? They suspended her for two weeks. You know why they suspended her? To show her who was the real boss. You hear what I'm saying? To show her who was the real boss. She made a mistake. But, you know, Whoopi got enough money to say, hey, the hell with it. Whoopi, there's Whoopi with our man Jacques. <laughs> Whoa, look at that. <laughs> but anyway, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, of course, she's going to probably come back on the show. And, and you know, and, and, and I, I just don't understand that, man. I, I really don't, man. Gary, take us out of here, please. Mel, thank you so much. We got to have you back, man. We got to have you back. Well, anytime. You know that, brother. All right. It, thank it's, you, Mel. It, it's, it's great having an Olympic hero on and everybody else. About the NFL, Black folks got short memories, and as long as it, it, for the owners, if it doesn't impact their pocketbook, they no. don't care because they know we got short memories and that we're going to be right back in those stands, right back in front of that television, downloading the NFL network. <laughs> they know this, and so they don't care. They can offend us because history says you can treat us any way you want and they will always come back. Amen. Hey, just remember, you cannot soar with eagles if you're hanging out with chickens. And that was most of us are doing. We're <laughs> hanging out with a bunch of chickens. Until next time, I'm Harold Bell, and you can color me gone. Be safe, everybody. Bye -bye. See you later. Bye.